Right, this lesson is looking at phylogenetic trees. Um, phylogenetic trees are also known as cladograms. And, um, you know, you're going to find that in different exam questions and different situations, uh, they'll be referred to as phylogenetic trees or as cladograms. It's a fairly interchangeable um, term that's used. Another important bit of terminology that you need to just have in your minds is that um, any lineage or group in a phylogeny or even when we're dealing with uh, any sort of taxonomic group in biology, uh, it might be a historical one, it might be a living group, it doesn't matter, that group gets referred to as a taxon. And the plural of taxon, if you have many of them, then you're dealing with taxa. T-A-X-A -A and T-A-X-O-N. Now, we talk about evolution in biology as being a unifying uh, theory or concept. And that's quite important. Uh, any theory that's unifying draws together a whole lot of different disciplines. And it stretches outside of just typical biology. It goes into geology and all sorts of other uh, fields of study. The central idea of, of evolution or biological evolution is that all life on Earth shares a common ancestor. So just as you and your cousins share a common grandmother, um, you know, each taxon on Earth at some stage shares a common ancestor. So this diagram over here is just showing you a typical family tree. The round circles represent females and the square represent um, males. In the bottom left we have Bob and Bob's sister, Bob's mom and Bob's dad. Uh, Bob's mom has two parents, Bob's grandfather and grandmother. That's the maternal grandfather and grandmother. Um, and of course Bob's cousins, number one, two and three, all of those um, cousins share the same maternal grandmother. And, you know, it's just really showing you common ancestry. In terms of evolution, it's, it's slightly different to that, um, but the concept's similar. And we're going to be looking at some trees and looking at some of the similarities. To, you, or you might pick up some similarities. Evolution itself is defined as descent with modification. Now, this is something we'll explore a lot more in grade 12. Um, but for now, what you need to understand is that phylogenetic trees are um, the tools that we use to, to really illustrate and show the evolutionary history of various taxa. So just as the family tree before shows um, documents and shows you how you and your cousins share a grandmother, um, you find that, that the um, phylogenetic trees are helping us to to look at and explore the evolution, evolutionary history of, of different taxa. Um, so basically this descent with modification um, is the, the concept is that the, the common ancestor of life, of essentially all life on earth, has given rise to a fantastic diversity that we see documented not only in the biological entities around us today, but also in the fossil record. Um, and this next slide over here shows you a phylogenetic tree. Um, this is out of your textbooks. And um, over here you can see that we have four major groups represented. Um, we've got the mosses on the top left, we've got the ferns, We've got the gymnosperms, or the conifers, as they're labelled here, and the flowering plants, as you should know, are known as the angiosperms. These are shown in the diagrams, uh, in this diagram, as the, the tips of the tree, these taxa, and they can be viewed as the descendants of a common ancestor that's shown at the root of the tree, which has been circled. Now it's also inherent in every tree, every phylogenetic tree, that um, you actually have time represented in that tree. 
it doesn't always have a timeline drawn in, but it's it's always that the more distant past will be represented as you go further down towards the root. And as you move from the root towards the tips of the tree, you move into the more recent uh, in terms of time. Often the tree is actually accompanied by a scale, and this is usually in the units of millions of years ago, MYA, millions of years ago, um, because evolution is a very, very slow process, and it, it takes millions of years to see change happening on, on this kind of scale. So, understanding a phylogeny is, again, a lot like reading a, fi uh, a family tree, but it's quite different. And if you take a close look at what the lines mean, the bottom, what is often called the root, is really representing the ancestral lineage. Wherever a line splits into two or more, what you're actually seeing represented there is a speciation event. Okay, I'm just neatening it up a bit. Um, I'm just going to call the tips here A, B, and C. Um, it's easy to refer to them uh, when I'm explaining this. And if you see the pink line over there, what that line is representing is the unique history of A, the taxon A, or the lineage A. The green line is showing you the unique history of the taxon B, and the blue line is showing you the unique history of uh, taxon C. Just neating it up a bit more. So we can take that idea of those unique histories and we can actually say, well, hang on, let's look at this dotted line now, it's further down. And um, that is actually showing us the shared history of both B and C. And likewise, the red line at the bottom is showing you the shared history of all three taxa, A, B, and C. So once upon a time, if you go down towards the root, you are going further back in time, and all, all three of those taxa, A, B, and C, had a common shared ancestor um, represented by the red line. Um, where the speciation event is shown, that would be the most recent common ancestor of all three of those taxa. Let's clear this up a bit and have a look at that. So if we label the, the speciation events there, or at least the, the last recent common ancestor as E and D, or D and E, um, you can actually describe quite nicely in words what you're seeing in this tree. And this is the kind of terminology that hopefully you'll start to get a little bit more familiar with and maybe even start to use by next year in grade 12. So according to this phylogeny, or phylogenetic tree, B and C are most closely related as they share a more recent common ancestor, D. Okay, so you basically look at the phylogeny, the phylogenetic tree, and you identify what we call sister taxa, taxa that are most closely related. So in this one, B and C are most closely related because as you move back in time, those two are the ones that share the most recent common ancestor, and that is represented by D in this diagram. A and B are related in that A, B, and C all share a common ancestor, but you can't talk about A and B being more closely related to each other than B and C, for instance, because you have to go further back in time to find the most recent common ancestor of all three of those, and that's at E. So A and B are related. A and B and C all share a common ancestor further back in time at E. Or at least E is representing that common ancestor of all three of those taxa. So going back to our diagram of the... Um, mosses, ferns, conifers, and flowering plants. So this is showing you the most recent common ancestors of each of these taxa. So we've got 
the angiosperms represented by A. That's where the monocots and the dicots sort of uh, split off into two separate taxa. B is showing you um, where the conifers would have uh, diverged from the flowering plants. C, where the ferns would have separated from the conifer flowering plant lineage, which of course at that stage had not differentiated into conifers versus flowering plants, but it was still an actual lineage. And likewise for D with the mosses and the re remaining or and the other lineages. Now it's quite useful to use these diagrams as well to plot what we call shared or derived characteristics. So all of these groups have various features and characteristics which you've been exploring in class, in class and, and looking at in class um, in various tables and things. We can actually take those characteristics and map them onto one of these trees and plot how these groups have um, changed and evolved through time. So, you know, we can start off with something quite simple, like water is not needed for reproduction. And that we first see happening sort of after the ferns. Um, we've got various others, um, like seeds. We first find seeds only in the conifer flowering gr uh, plant group. Fruit we only find with the angiosperms, the flowering plants. Uh, true leaves and roots only emerges um, once we have the sort of dominance of the sporophyte uh, generation. And um, you, you see that in this tree as in the fern conifer flowering pl plant group. Um, vascular tissue, likewise. And way up at the top, we have various features differentiating the monocotyledons from the dicotyledons. Um, and also fruit and flowers um, holding together the flowering plants. Now, you have to assume, when you're looking at this kind of diagram, that all descendants from where the characteristic is plotted, is plotted um, from, from there on are possessing the characteristic. So if we look at seeds as an example, you plot on the phy uh, phylogenetic tree seeds, and further onwards, towards the more recent in time, all of those lineages, all of those taxa, will have that characteristic. Um, to use another example, if we um, highlight fruit and flowers, you see that from where that characteristic is plotted onto this phylogeny, you move further forward in time along the family tree, along the phylogeny, you find only those lineages possess that characteristic. And that's how you kind of plot these on or how you read these characteristics off of this tree, off, off of this phylo, uh, phylogenetic tree. And um, that's the lesson for now. So I'm sure you're going to have lots of questions and hopefully you can ask away. Thank you.